And you want to go for an hour, right? Yes. Um, okay. It's very wonderful to welcome Mark Moyer to the program. He is the Chair of Military History at Hillsdale College. And in this hour, we are discussing his new book, Triumph Regain, the Vietnam War, 1965 to 1968. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks you for having me on. So I understand that this is the second part in a planned trilogy about the war in Vietnam. Uh, the first, I believe, is Triumph Forsaken, in which you chronicle the war from uh 1954 to 63. so i wonder have you got a title for the planned third and final book yet not totally sure but um at the moment i'm thinking of triumph betrayed because the fall of vietnam i do view as a betrayal by the united states of south vietnam and it's obviously going to have a rather tragic ending as we as we all know but yes i'm working on that volume now which will go from 69 to 75. okay wonderful um i understand that um on january the 27th which is uh two weeks ago was the anniversary 51st of the signing of the paris peace accords um it's a day that uh i think most vietnamese people including myself remember uh, as the day that the Americans uh, got away from Vietnam. So I wonder if Americans remember the date at all, how do they remember it? Now, that's a good question. Uh, certainly, Americans who lived through that, I think, remember it. I think at the time, there was real hope that South Vietnam could persevere. You know, I think one of the great questions, which I'm still working on the answer to is uh was there still a chance for south vietnam after the paris peace accords uh and i still have a lot of research to do my preliminary view is that in fact there was a chance because if you look at what happens right after the paris peace accords the south vietnamese military is still fighting pretty well and they continue to fight well until the middle of 1974 when the united states starts to decrease its aid and we also thanks to watergate uh, know that the united states would not live up to its promises to bomb and had the united states been willing to do that i think it could have saved south vietnam and certainly south vietnam was put into a difficult position by the paris peace accords because the uh, nixon administration did not require the north vietnamese to withdraw their troops from South Vietnam, as earlier the Nixon administration had insisted upon. And I think there's also a real question of, did the United States get the best terms it could have gotten? Because just before this, the United States bombs North Vietnam extremely intensively, and North Vietnam is in a pretty tough spot. So I think that's still a question to be answered as well. Um, another significant date in um, the Vietnamese public mind is the 30th of April. It's a national holiday uh, in Vietnam, actually. Um, uh, it is is remembered as Reunification Day, where we're from, but in America, it's remembered as the fall of Saigon. Um, I do believe that the signing of the Paris Peace Accords effectively handed over the Saigon regime to the North Vietnamese. So I wonder what do Americans, what have Americans learned and what have they not learned from the fall of Saigon? Well, it depends who you ask. I mean, most of the Vietnam veterans I know view the fall of Saigon as a, a tragedy and uh, one that could have been avoided had we stuck by our allies. Now, there are other Americans who think that South Vietnam was a lost cause and this was just uh, inevitable and... I think we're still split by that division. You know, the history of the war as a whole is very, very controversial. And a lot of the historians and what I call the Orthodox school tend to see this as a hopeless cause from the beginning. But I disagree and, and view this abandonment of South Vietnam in 1975 as really one of the worst things the United States has 
ever done. And unfortunately, uh, I think we made a similar mistake in the case of Afghanistan, but people like uh, President Biden and others who didn't uh, think very much about or weren't troubled by the, the loss of Vietnam seemed also not to be worried that um, the United States was going to abandon another ally. And um, we've seen, I think, for the people of Afghanistan, it's been as disastrous, I think, in many ways as it was for the people of South Vietnam to have this opposing totalitarian government take over. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when you compare mm, what happened after the fall of Saigon to after the fall of Afghanistan, um, how did the U.S. Uh, handle the refugee situation? And did it do it better in Vietnam than Afghanistan or vice versa? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, you know, the U.S. did bring a lot of people out of South Vietnam, but we also know that huge numbers were put into re-education camps, uh, and many of whom died in, in those camps. So clearly the United States was not able to get out a lot of the people who were going to face retribution. Um, I think we've seen a similar problem in Afghanistan um, that the Taliban have been uh, inflicting punishment, killing people who were seen as supporting the United States and who were not able to get out. And of course, in both cases, we had um, a rather disorganized evacuation at the end um, where some of the people who should have got out were not able to be withdrawn. And that's part of the uh, disgrace of the whole thing in both both of these cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, give us an overview of the revisionist school of um, Vietnam War historiography in which uh, I presume you are a part of. Yes. Well, the revisionist school, let me first start by the orthodox school because that really is what first came in and the re revisionist school was a reaction to it. But the, the orthodox school argued that this war was something that was unnecessary, was not in the U.S. national interest, and that, in addition, it was unwinnable. So unnecessary and unwinnable are the two fundamental arguments. And then within that, they would say that uh, communism in Vietnam did not really pose a great threat to the United States and that... Um, in fact, the communists really weren't so bad, and maybe they were even better than the South Vietnamese government. And they look at uh, possible alternative strategies that were proposed for that might have led to a different outcome. And they contend that really, no matter what the United States did, uh, it was a losing cause. So the revisionists disagree head on with these points, and and I certainly do. Uh, fall within that camp. But on the question of was it necessary, revisionists would say that there was, in fact, a international threat of communism, not just in Vietnam, but that the fall of Vietnam would lead to the fall of other countries in the region, the so-called domino theory. So we would argue that the domino theory is, in fact, correct, particularly in 1965 when the U.S. decides to intervene that there's lots of evidence that, in fact, fall of South Vietnam would have caused most of Asia to fall to communism, and that would have had devastating impact on the United States. And that you can even see that through today. If you think of current American competition with China, we rely on a lot of these other Asian countries, such as uh, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Philippines. And had, had, had we bailed out of Vietnam earlier, they would have fallen. Now, the counter to that as well. 1975, a lot of these countries did not fall. And the my response to that is that Vietnam changes the dynamics in in Asia and it destroys the alliance between China and North Vietnam, which had been the threat at the beginning. It creates new tensions in in uh, Southeast Asia. And then as far as the question of was it winnable, uh, revisionists would say that there were a lot of missed opportunities one was the 
uh, coup of 1963, where the United States over supported the overthrow of President Ziem, we would argue that without that coup, probably the war would never have gotten as bad as it did. And then we also would say that there were opportunities missed to either invade North Vietnam, bomb North Vietnam more heavily, intervene in Cambodia and Laos, and that had those courses been pursued, the outcome could have been different. And then lastly, too, that if the United States had maintained its aid after the Paris Peace Accords, that also South Vietnam would have uh, had a good chance to, to survive. Um, I first became aware of the revisionist school when I came across uh, Michael Linz's book, uh, Vietnam, the Necessary War. Um, I actually had uh, Professor Lin on this show, even though Vietnam was in part of the discussion. But I suppose um, I suppose your outline of the revisionist school uh, school invites uh, questions of my own. Uh, one is, if the domino theory is correct, then well, when Vietnam effectively became a communist nation, both north and south during seventy five, then it should mean that almost all of Southeast Asia would turn red, so to speak. But the nations that I believe turned red after 75 were two other countries, its neighbors, uh, Laos and Cambodia. Um, I don't believe um, Thailand was affected, neither did Indonesia. It had a brutally anti-communist uh, dictatorship at that time, certainly not the Philippines and certainly not Singapore. So uh, how would you respond to that? Yes, yeah, so... But in Triumph Forsaken, the first volume, I look at what's going on in 1965, because the argument that 75 tells us anything about the domino theory assumes that things are pretty much the same. But I questioned that and said, OK, well, let's look at 1965. In 1965, nobody knows what's, of course, going to happen in 1975. And what you have in 1965 is all of the countries in the region saying, telling the Americans, if you leave, the whole region is going to fall. And some of them, many of them offer to send troops to Vietnam for that purpose. And so that's one very important thing to keep in mind. And that's what the Americans were acting on. Um, now, what are the big changes then between 65 and 75? Well, the first one, happens very quickly and this is covered in triumph regained at the beginning the indonesian military has a confrontation with sukarno sukarno has been moving steadily towards the communist camp and he attempts to kill off the leadership of the indonesian uh Indo indonesian military in october of 1965 he kills some of them but others are able to rally and turn against him. And as I note in the book, there is a lot of evidence, uh, including statements from Saharto, the leader, that in fact, it was American intervention in Vietnam that convinced them to resist Sukarno, that they believed that if they did not have, uh, if, if it appeared that America was backing out of the region, then they would have let Sukarno do what he wanted. So that's one of the most important things that happens. And that's really the most important domino in Southeast Asia. And then as you move along, and as I chronicle and triumph regained, you have the Vietnam War itself creating new splits within the communist movement. You know, in 65, China and North Vietnam are very close allies. They're seen as supporting each other. China actually has uh, a huge number of troops that it sends to North Vietnam to free up North Vietnamese troops. But because of the war and American pressure uh, and American air power, the Soviets become much more involved in helping North Vietnam. And then this creates distrust between uh, North Vietnam and China, as does the Cultural Revolution. And so you see in 1968, things really start to fall apart between North Vietnam and China and China withdrawing its troops. Uh, the Cultural Revolution itself is an important part of this equation because in 1965, China is very externally oriented. It wants to spread revolution. And then 
American intervention in Vietnam frustrates what it's trying to do in Vietnam. And then the Indonesian problem foils China's designs for Indonesia. And so we see Mao turning inward as a result of these foreign policy setbacks and launching this cultural revolution, which uh, we know to be highly devastating to China's country and its economy. And it will then leave China without this same sort of ambitious internationalism by the time we get to 1975. Uh, we also have President Nixon will exploit these uh, differences among the communist countries uh, rather skillfully and um, pull them apart. You also have other countries in the region like Thailand, Singapore, Philippines, Japan, um, becoming stronger between 65 and 75. They, they form ASEAN and they, um, you know, a number of them have said most prominently Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore that essentially American intervention bought the time for these countries to strengthen their defenses and get on their feet so that they could still withstand the fall of Vietnam. Okay. So my second question to the revisionist narrative would be, um, was it necessary to create um, a South Vietnamese regime? Um, you know, I think I, I asked this knowing that efforts in um, nation building from, you know, American government and military have uh, at best been mixed. Mm -hmm. Well, from a strategic point of view, in 1954, when the regime comes to power, there is certainly a sense that setting up South Vietnamese government will serve American interests. I mean, the French have struck a deal with the North Vietnamese to split the country in two. Now, there is initially a question of, is this really feasible? You know, a lot of people think that the Xiem government's not going to survive very long. And Xiem, however, is able, largely on his own initiative, to defeat his internal enemies. And he becomes a symbol of effective anti-communism and nationalism in the region, uh, and it's an interesting question. What what if the U.S. had just never done anything there, or if it had bailed out right away? Um, certainly, would have had some negative effects. You know, whether it would have been as serious as later is, uh, I think, debatable. I mean, certainly, uh, as time goes on, the more uh, you know, at the end of Eisenhower period, you still have fewer than a thousand uh, American troops there, but under Kennedy, you have this increase to 16,000 American personnel. And then under Johnson, it escal it goes up from there. And so it becomes harder and harder for the United States to back down because superpowers generally don't abandon allies in the, in the middle of conflicts if they want to maintain their prestige. And it does seem, you know, there's also this idea that, well, maybe we pull out and fight in Laos, but, but then it becomes clear that Laos is pretty uh, weak place uh, their government's weak, and so that would not actually be a good alternative. And Kennedy talks about how you know the Vietnamese actually are willing to fight, and they often are pretty effective. Now, the question of you know nation building is an interesting one since it's going on in other places. And as you said, the, the record is mixed. Uh, I think a lot of the record on this is related to culture. I wrote, wrote a book called Aid for Elites, actually talking all about this question of nation building, uh, you know, some people think, I think that it's universally failed. It, uh, I think the record shows that uh, it depends a lot on culture. If you look, uh, in, it's usually not been very effective in, in Muslim cultures, at least in terms of uh, imposing or inculcating sort of democratic values, but it has been pretty effective in uh, Asian countries and some Asian countries, I think South Korea is the best example. And so I I like to point out that South Korea shows us really what South Vietnam could have become. And if you look at South Korea in the 50s and 60s, most of the criticisms that people made about South Vietnam were also made of South Co Korea, that it was autocratic, that it was its leaders were corrupt. But you know, over time, we've seen South Korea evolve into a democratic country with one of the strongest 
economies in the world. And I think American nation building efforts had a lot to do with that, particularly in terms of educating an elite class capable of governing in, in a democratic way. And so I think that process was moving along in South Vietnam and certainly I think would have been if beneficial had it persisted. I think, again, if we look at the Korean example, um, South Korea, they said a vibrant country, um, highly prosperous. North Korea is one of the worst places you could possibly live. Uh, you know, Vietnam isn't quite as bad as North Korea, but if you look in terms of uh, per capita GDP, democracy, human rights, uh, Vietnam is quite a bit closer to North Korea than it is to South Korea. Well, um, I think um, the the question of America's commitment to South Vietnam is, for me at least, do not hold up under scrutiny with um, the 1963 um, coup that uh, ousted um, President Diem and his brother. Um, it And for me, I think from an American perspective even, it is unthinkable that the U.S. would um, engineer or help engineer the overthrow of one of its allies, his leadership. It's it's almost the same as, uh, you know, during this time, uh, uh, you know, American intelligence would help oust, was it Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu or, or some, or the Taiwanese leader or something like that. So uh, I wonder, was, was the, um, like, was the ousting of the necessary or strategically uh, viable? Uh, well, I talk about it a lot in the first volume, Triumph Forsaken, and I argue it was the single biggest mistake of the war as far as the United States was concerned and the most disastrous thing to happen to South Vietnam. And you know, when I first started studying this, I actually was skeptical that the United States really had such a large role in this. But as I spent more time looking at it, it became clear to me that in fact, it was essentially orchestrated by the American ambassador, Henry Cabot Lodge. And I, there's a lot of new details in the book that hadn't come out before this. And what's also very interesting is that there's a huge debate within the United States government over whether this is a good idea. A lot of people, uh, such as um, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, CIA Director Robert uh, or John McCone, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, are saying this would be terrible um, in part because this is our ally and you don't want to go around overthrowing allied governments, but also that ZM is actually a pretty effective leader and that if he's replaced, things are likely to get worse. But Lodge is convinced uh, by ZM's opponents, including David Halberstam and Neil Sheehan, who become two of the most famous chroniclers of the war, that they convince him that Siam is bad. He's not being uh, accommodating enough to these Buddhist protesters that are protesting, and that if only we would get rid of him, things are going to get much better. Now, when you look at what happens after, it's impossible to argue that things get better. It's pretty clear that things get worse. And as I've found, it got even worse than is often believed. And what you have is people like Howard, Sam, and Sheehan write the history such that uh, this coup was not such a big deal because they supported it. And so they really want to downplay it. But uh, if you look, especially now what we know from the North Vietnamese side, they view this as a huge windfall. South Vietnamese government is paralyzed. Its strategic Hamlet program is dismantled. There's a bunch of follow on coups where they purge people who are seen to be loyal to Ziem. And this really sets the conditions for the 1965 invasion of South Vietnam by North Vietnam. And it's only American ground troops that uh, are able to prevent a uh, complete defeat. As I said, this, this coup against Ziem was um, disastrous. Uh, as you say, the question of does it make sense at all for America to overthrow its its allies? Um, you know, I think perhaps you could find an extreme case if there's a leader who's totally off his rocker. But it said case against ZM 
was pretty weak at the time and in hindsight it looks even weaker that's that's what i think too um i suppose um give us an overview of the uh buddhist catholic divide that uh, went on in south vietnam at that time mm -hmm. you know this is central to the controversy in 1963 you have so-called militant buddhist movement who starts accusing the South Vietnamese government of religious persecution uh, initially stems from a controversy over flying of religious flags. And some Catholics had been flying flags. And then ZM says that we should stop this religious flag waving. And then the Buddhists wave theirs and they um, uh, are told they have to stop. And then there's a confrontation in which eight people are killed. And we still don't know who started it, whether it was the government soldiers or the uh, saboteurs among these militant Buddhists. Uh, but then there's a period of escalating tensions and demonstrations. And one of the big questions is, were these Buddhists collaborating with the communists? President Ziem believed so. Uh, I argue there's clearly evidence of collaboration. Now, the most important uh, Buddhist uh, Tri Quang is um, suspected of being in the pocket of the communists. I don't think we have ever had conclusive evidence one or the other, but a lot of people will argue as time goes on that he uh, clearly is doing everything he can to abet the communist cause. And uh, there's also, you know, I think a lot of misunderstanding in the West that that these militants are representative of the Buddhists. And in 63, it's a little unclear. There's another Buddhist uprising in 1966 where it becomes more evident that most of the Buddhists of South Vietnam do not sympathize with these militants, that this is sort of a radical faction. You have a lot of other Buddhists saying that they should not be meddling in politics in this way. Um, and you know, there's also uncertainty exactly over who qualifies as a Buddhist um, some people say up there up to 80% of the population was Buddhist, but I think most people would say that maybe half of that, you had a lot of people who were considering themselves sort of Confucians by faith. Um, and you also have the Catholics who are about 10% of the population and um, who are among the most zealous of anti-communists. But you know, for most of the conflict, the Buddhists and the Catholics get along. We see Buddhists and Catholics in the government um, working together. I mean, under the Xi'an regime, he had plenty of Buddhists that were working for him. And so this idea of religious conflict is, is mostly one that's manufactured by these militant Buddhists and exploited by the communists. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's true that when you visit Vietnam today, um, when you tell, when you ask people who, well, what is your religious faith? And they would answer Buddhists. Um, there's a good chance that, um, they they are not what you call observant Buddhists. Um, they mm -hmm. attend temple once or twice a year, particularly during this time of uh, Vietnamese New Year. But um, I don't think they would mm -hmm. they can recite the scripture or understand the I guess the the Buddhist is teaching. So right. I, I would also like to mention that the um, the conflict between the Buddhists and the Catholics at that time uh, obviously was represented by a very well known photo uh, of the monk uh, Tikwang Duc. Uh, uh, setting himself on fire. Um, when Time Magazine published that photo, um, I think Americans were incensed, right? They they thought that he was, uh, was protesting against the war in general, but really he was just going up against the ZM government. Um, talk to me a bit about the National Liberation Front, or also known as the Viet Cong. So when did they begin to uh, launch uh, campaigns against the the southern government. And so in 1954, when the country is divided, there are communists in the south who have supported the Viet Minh, and uh, many of them decide they're going to head to North Vietnam. There's this period where people can go from one side to the other. There's also about a, a million northerners head to the south um, to flee what they fear will be a um, despotic regime. Many of them are Catholics because the Catholics were supportive of the French generally and the communists 
are not very friendly towards religion in general. Uh, but the communists initially think that the situation in the South is so chaotic, the government's so weak, that they can subvert the government by political means. And so they will spend first several years trying through political agitation to overthrow the South Vietnamese government. But South Vietnamese government turns out to be stronger than anticipated and becomes increasingly effective in hunting down communist sympathizers who are still in the South. And so in 1959, the North Vietnamese make the decision to move towards an armed struggle. And this will begin in January of 1960. And they create what they call the National Liberation Front. And it's similar to the Viet Minh that had fought against the French. It's ostensibly a co uh, coalition of opposition elements, and not specifically communist, but in reality is controlled by the communists. And they, they advertise it as non-communist in order to win over people in the South and to influence international opinion. And they're more effective in terms of the international influence that they can within the South. A lot people generally know that this is controlled by the communists. The communists have been around a long time and their methods are known. But internationally, there are a lot of people in the West who will argue that this is a grassroots independent movement that's not just commie, it may have some communists, but it has all these other people. Um, and for a long time, that there were a lot of people arguing that and saying, this is a reason the United States shouldn't get involved, that this is just a, a local insurgency. Now we know, and some people recognize this at the time, but since the war's over, it's a great amount of evidence put out that makes clear that this National, National Liberation Front was under the control of Hanoi from the very beginning. And Hanoi starts in, during 1960 sending some of the people who had came north in 54 back into the south to staff this national liberation front which will uh, organize armed insurrection uh, initially mainly guerrilla warfare but with the intent of moving towards more conventional warfare as time goes on yeah i think i think if um i was vietnamese uh, if i was living at that time then I think I would share the opinion of most Vietnamese, uh, North and South, that yes, of course, that guerrilla movement, the NLF, NLF is, has ties with Hanoi. That goes without saying. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, but let's move to the U.S. Um, I wonder if um, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats at that time, were they in agreement regarding the goal of what to do in Vietnam? Uh, I say this knowing that um, the 1964 campaign was particularly controversial because um, Lyndon Johnson basically alleged uh, that Barry Goldwater was uh, going to deploy the nuclear option uh, towards uh, the North. So, mm -hmm. Yes, in 1964, there still is broadly a consensus in both parties that containing communism is a good thing and for that reason, doing something in Vietnam <laughs> makes sense. Uh, but Johnson, to to win the re-election campaign, he senses that people don't want to send American troops there. It's a little bit analogous to Ukraine today, where a lot of people support helping Ukraine, but don't want to send American troops there. So he uh, and he tries to depict Goldwater as this warmonger, and so. Uh, says that repeatedly and he also says explicitly several times i'm not going to send american boys to vietnam to fight a war that the asian boys can fight and so uh this inadvertently helps convince the north vietnamese that south vietnam is going to be ripe for the taking and so as soon as johnson wins that election in november of 1964 the north vietnamese set in motion the deployment of entire infantry divisions with the objective of winning the war by the end of 1965. Now, turns out Johnson is willing to send American boys. He doesn't want to, but he sees uh, 
as things are getting worse for the South Vietnamese in early 1965, he recognizes that the, there is this very real possibility of falling dominoes. And so he'll ultimately put American ground troops in the war. At, at that point in time, the war is highly popular in both parties. And even the liberal wing of the Democratic Party is quite supportive. Over time, you start to see that um, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party is losing faith in the conflict. The, the costs are too high. So when you get to the 1968 election, you have the liberal Democrats calling for a, a coalition government in the South, uh, withdrawal of American troops. Uh, but that position is rejected even within the Democratic Party, which at that time has a large conservative wing, a lot of moderates. And so Hubert Humphrey, when he uh, gets the nomination, uh, takes the position that, yes, we, we are going to continue Lyndon Johnson's policy of protecting South Vietnam. Uh, and Republicans in general have, are supportive, most of them. And Johnson actually becomes frustrated as he's president that the Republicans are more supportive of the war than he is. Um, now, once Nixon becomes president, Democrats become more vociferous in opposing the war, um, liberals and some of the moderates, because now they no longer feel like they're attacking their own party's president. And um, so over time, you will see support fade, especially in the Democrats. Some of the Republicans, too, will um, eventually lose interest, in, including um, Nixon's own Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, is sort of, um, over time is concerned that Vietnam's costing too much and that um, we need to downsize. And so you have splits between within both parties as time goes on. Um, as you get near the end, it's certainly the Republicans who are more uh, favorable towards the war, but Nixon's uh, fall through Watergate um, leads to larger Democratic majorities and, and then thus ensures that the aid is going to get taken away and that South Vietnam will be doomed to destruction. Now, one of the notable um, elements, I believe, in the, the American discourse regarding the Vietnam War is that it was mostly uh, dominated by Americans. Um, is uh, there's this um, concern going back to the founding of America, even that um, when America gets entangled in, say, foreign conflict, then the immigrants or the people who had ties to the country that uh, that America happens to be in conflict with at that time may be, yeah, you know, maybe more vocal. For example, in in World War II, you have such a thing as the German-American boon or something like that. Um, I wonder if uh, during your research, you've uh, looked into whether there were like Vietnamese-American public opinion at that time and what were they like? Mm -hmm. Well, the, you know, first of all, I'd say that it is true, it has been true that the Vietnamese do not play a large role in many of the histories and to the extent that they have um especially the early histories mostly fo focused on the north vietnamese and the south vietnamese got very little coverage other than to be sort of depicted as having these corrupt leaders which i think is very false in my books i've spent quite a bit of time on the the vietnamese side both north and south and um and particularly president ziema i think was uh greatly underestimated by the Americans. Um, and there's more real support for the war in South Vietnam than people think. Um, and we've also got a lot of information now from the North Vietnamese side that I use to show what the North Vietnamese are thinking. And it's actually oftentimes different from what people thought. Uh, in terms of uh, Vietnamese within the United States, I mean, there's very few in uh, during the war itself. Um, so they don't really have and even, you know, Asian Americans more broadly are very small. So there's not um, really any um, activity on their part. I mean, the closest thing we do have, um, Madame Cheneau, Chinese, who's supposedly um, trying to work with the Nixon campaign to uh, 
affect the outcome of the election. She's a diehard anti-communist. Uh, I think that has been overstated. Her role was really not that big in all of this. Uh, but she's the the Asian American, I think, who probably may have had the most influence. Obviously, when you have this huge inflow of refugees after the war, the Vietnamese American community does become, you know, significant um, group of voters who you know have influence over American politics. Um. So we are talking during the Vietnamese New Year. So. Let's talk about the Tet Offensive of 1968. Um, incidentally, it I believe it was the year of the monkey, so uh, which is what this year is too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand that for Vietnamese people, uh, at least in Vietnamese historiography, it was hailed as a triumph, a victory. Um, and uh, in, in America at that time too, it was... Uh, thought of as a victory for the North Vietnamese. And because it happened during election year, it had significant political significance. But in my reading of the, I suppose, revisionist literature, um, the victory, at least militarily, was not that significant. So tell me more about that. Yeah, so one of the things that, um, in I, I cover this in great detail in Triumph Regained, uh, it's worth looking at how the Tet Offensive comes about. There's been this perception, especially in the United States, that that the North Vietnamese were supremely patient. They were um, they were just going to do fight this war out as long as it took. Didn't matter how many people got killed. Uh, but we know from North Vietnamese sources now that in the spring of 1967, they have become very impatient what's going on because they've been sustaining huge casualties in combat against the United States and they don't want to kind of keep doing what they've been doing. They want, and they don't want to they see this drag on and on. And so their idea is we are going to try to do something different and win this war very quickly. So their idea is they will, attack the cities, which they've mostly ignored, they mostly until now they've been fighting jungles and swamps and mountains. Uh, but they're going to go and attack the cities and they believe the people are going to rise up in support of them. And they cite things like the Russian Revolution, 1917, or the uh, takeover of Hanoi, 1945. And and not all of them believe this, but uh, Le Zuan, who has now become this chief leader, he buys this argument that there's all this resentment in the cities. If we go in, people will rise up with us, help us defeat the South Vietnamese, and the Americans then at that point will, um, the South Vietnamese government's been destroyed, that the Americans will just decide that probably it's time for peace and we'll go home. So they move forward with this. And what happens is the opposite of what they had forecast. They they enter the cities. They do achieve surprise by attacking during the holiday when uh, a lot of the South Vietnamese personnel are off. But the people do not rise up in support at all. And in fact, communist accounts will say that the people in many cases uh, reported where the communist forces were to the government troops. Uh, the government troops get organized and the Americans do as well. And one of the problems that they didn't fully seem to take into account was that once you're in the cities, uh, you're, you've exposed yourself to American and South Vietnamese firepower because they, they try initially to hold on to areas. Uh, it's not like when they've fought in the jungle or the mountains where they can run away when things get too difficult. So they're trying to hold territory. They get crushed. Um, and in most places, it's 24 hours or so before they're destroyed. In Saigon, they hold on for about two weeks. Uh, the city of Hue, they hold on for about a month. because They've sent a lot more troops there and they massacre several thousand people before they are driven out there. And then... Um, but yet in the American press, a lot of people claim that this 
was a victory because the communists showed that they were capable of doing more than thought. Um, and then we have, um, one thing I'd say about that too, is that, um, you know, the North Vietnamese do throw in uh, a lot and they also though get, um, suffer, you know, horrific casualties. And so they really don't benefit at all militarily. Uh, and then we have two more offensives, which are less known in May and August of 1968. What's interesting about these offensives is that the North Vietnamese decide to use the same playbook. Uh, and Lee Zwan is told by other Vietnamese officers, well, we got crushed this first time. We shouldn't do this again. But he says, no, we're going to attack the cities again. And this time the people will rise up. And but again, it fails in uh, in by the end of the August offensive, the North Vietnamese army is in tatters and Lezuan finally realizes that they're going to have to stop. But this really um, this period from January to August of 1968 is huge, crushing military defeat for North Vietnamese. And this will then allow the Americans in the Nixon period to start withdrawing troops uh, without seeing a, a significant uh, downgrade in the military situation. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about the uh, war atrocities that happened during this period of 65 and 68. Understand, I understand that um, they were committed by all sides of the conflict. I know that the North committed some, the South committed some, and the Americans, of course, committed some, uh, as documented in what happened in uh, Sun Mi or Mi Lai. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I um, you know, I talk about Mi Lai in the book, um, and it is, it, it was a few officers at the low level who uh, allowed this to happen, and once it was identified, I mean, American helicopter pilot sees this going on and reports it and the uh, order is quickly given to stop. So it only lasts about four hours, but there's around 500 women and children are killed. And um, then the U.S. will try to cover this up because it would look very embarrassing. And, um, you know, it will not be until 1969 that it comes to light. And then that raises a lot of questions about uh, is this an isolated incident or is this something happening a lot? And there are at the time some people arguing that, yeah, this kind of thing happens every day. But you know, there was subsequently great number of investigations and they found that uh, there was no other atrocity of this type on such a big scale. Now, there were certainly killings of civilians um, from time to time. Uh, if you look at other wars, this is um, not particularly unusual when you have, you know, a half million young men with guns. Uh, there's going to be a few criminal elements that are going to um, do bad things. There's a much larger number of civilians who are injured or killed in crossfire of battle um, because oftentimes the communists would fight or occupy populated areas and so the americans did put in restrictions to limit damage to civilians and, but there's certainly going to be civilian casualties so again if you look at other wars of the 20th century there are similarly great numbers of civilian casualties who are just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, on the north vietnamese side we do see uh the case of Huey. there's a a systematic killing of at least 3,000 people. And we do know that this had sanction from above. So it wasn't the same as in Mi Lai, where it was just a few junior people. This was a, a policy. And we know that the communists in other cities uh, were trying to do the same thing, that they believed that they needed to kill uh, the most significant leadership elements on the South Vietnamese side. And this was something they'd been doing, you know, on a smaller scale throughout the war is they would try to assassinate local officials who were particularly good and effective 
And but because they fail militarily outside of Hawaii, they're not really able to do this in other places. But um, you know, we'll see this, you know, again throughout the war when they have a chance to kill, uh, you know, they won't say kill a huge group of people, but they will want to kill what they view as the leadership elements. <laughs> now, final question. Um I wonder could there be a different outcome for the war? Um, now, one of the alternatives that I've sort of explored, and this is the one that I'm quite worried about since I'm actually a North Vietnamese, I was born in Hanoi, that um, the Americans would uh, win, but the South regime would hold, and North Vietnam would end up in the same fate as something like East Germany or North Korea. So mm -hmm. if that outcome ever happened, then someone like me wouldn't be talking to someone like you. So mm -hmm. I I guess the weight of history uh, bears heavily down upon uh, me whenever the topic of the Vietnam War comes up. So I'd mm -hmm. like to hear you uh, explore some of the ways in which the war could have ended differently. Yeah, well, that is, so this is one of the most fundamental questions of the war. And I will say, too, it was historians, and we can never say with 100% certainty what would have happened. And so some people say, well, we shouldn't even then talk about it. But if you don't say, if you don't look at the counterfactual of what might have been, uh, makes it very difficult to conclude much of anything because, um, you know, if a decision is made, you can't say, well, this was, you know, the correct decision or a wise decision if you have no idea what the alternatives were, how they might have ended up. So we do need to think about um, the probabilities of certain things working. So, so I think the first opportunity that was missed that would have really fundamentally changed the war uh, would have been this coup in 1963. So had President Ziem not been assassinated, I think that the war would have probably continued for a while as more of a low-grade guerrilla war. And... If that had happened, probably unlikely the U.S. would ever have sent large numbers of troops. And what North Vietnam would have done um, is an open question. Um, you know, it's, would they at some point have decided um, that maybe we should focus more on the North and and take a break on this war? Certainly, a possibility. Um, again, if you look at what happened in Korea, the North Koreans were also resolute communists that yet at some point they said, you know, this isn't really working for us. Um, or they could have again, ultimately still launched a big conventional offensive, but it would have been against a um, stronger South Vietnamese government. Um, so we don't, it's hard to know exactly how that would have worked out, but certainly would have taken a different path. Now, um, when you get to 65, 66, 67, there's these discussions about what if the United States goes, uh, extends the ground war into Laos, Cambodia, or North Vietnam? At the time, President Johnson was afraid that doing those things was going to bring China into the war, at, similar to what had happened in the Korean War where the Chinese come in. Uh, a lot of other people are telling him, well, the Chinese don't want to come in, and so we'd be foolish not to do these. But he uh, is simply too worried about that prospect that he refuses to authorize these things. Now, the benefit of hindsight, we've seen Chinese sources make pretty clear that they were not going to get involved because uh, they had suffered huge losses in Korea and they didn't really feel that they wanted to do that again. So there were missed opportunities there. And certainly uh, the invasion of North Vietnam, uh, well, there are different ideas contemplated. Some were just a limited invasion, but others you know, would have been aimed at sort of taking Hanoi. And um, that certainly would have put things in a different light. I mean, at minimum, you probably would have turned the war into something like the war against the French, where the French hold uh, Hanoi and other cities. And that would have made it more difficult. I mean, uh, the communists would not have had access to as much manpower they wouldn't have had ports where they could bring in aid from the Soviets in China. Um, and then there's also the question, if you go into Cambodia and Laos, the Ho Chi Minh Trail is there, which is the main supply artery 
Now, eventually, South Vietnamese forces will go in into Cambodia and Laos in 70 and 71, uh, but on a more limited scale. Um, and so those are not permanent solutions. And then um, I said there's question of you know, the Paris Peace Accords. Could the United States have gotten better terms? Could they have convinced the North Vietnamese to um, withdraw their forces? I think it's possible. I'm not sure. Um, and then after 73, uh, I think certainly had the U.S. maintained its military aid and had it been willing to use air power um, in the latter stages of the war, uh, well, certainly, as I said, South Vietnam is fighting pretty well until the aid starts to dry up. And then in 1975, the North Vietnamese, they test the Americans by attacking um, Song Bay to see what the Americans are going to do. The Americans don't do anything. Now, had the Americans just said, we're going to start bombing, I think the North Vietnamese back off at that point. And um, South Vietnam survived. Now, what exactly would have happened next? Hard to know. But um, I think certainly there were there are numerous opportunities for the United States to prevent South Vietnam falling. And unfortunately it missed all of those opportunities. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much, Mark Moya, for joining this program. Thanks very much for having me.